Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Line Change, the NHL betting podcast from the Action Network. My name is Michael Leboff, and joining me for this Wednesday episode are Tim Kalinowski and Nick Martin. Uh, together, the three of us are going to break down the two game slate on Wednesday night. It's actually pretty good uh, for just two games. And then uh, we have some awards talk and a, a pertinent bet to make um, a 50 to 1 whopper. Uh, to make uh, I, I won't give a spoiler on what market it is but um, get ready for it uh, but before we get to that let's talk about the Bruins and Lightning to start the first of two games we'll discuss it's the headliner Boston on the second night of a back-to-back there in Florida on Tuesday night the Lightning coming back after a very successful jaunt on the west coast close to a pick em. Boston right now is a slight underdog Minus 106. This total is at five and a half. I like the Bruins here, actually. Um, I think that we're seeing the the Lightning get a a lot more credit than maybe you'd want to give them as a better. Um, the, uh, full credit to them for winning. Uh, they've looked good. 6-0-1 in their last seven. The, the schedule has had uh, some, some big dogs on it, too. It's not like they were just beating up on the Sharks and the Ducks. Uh, they did do that, too. Uh, they didn't really beat up on the Ducks, but they did get the win. Um, but this comes down to the status of Braden Point and Victor Hedman. Uh, both are day to day, so I think barring any injuries or unforeseen chicanery from the Bruins Panthers game on Tuesday night, I I like Boston here. I think that uh, you're you're just getting a good number on the better team against the, a depleted roster, and we already know that this this Lightning roster is is so top heavy. So taking those two guys out, uh, and Victor Hedman, by the way. Weird, weird that it's quietly been a good season for him, but I think that we haven't maybe give him given him enough credit, Nick. So, uh, what do you think about Lightning Bruins on Wednesday night? Yeah, I'm right with you. I think this is uh, minus 105. The current price is a, a great price to bet on the Bruins. I view them as the better team, even in, in a back to back. I think this is a good spot to target them, especially. Uh, keep in mind that it it does sound very hard to predict kind of where Point and Hedman are at, but I would view that as a really good number of Point and Hedman sat out. So kind of keep that in mind um, Wednesday morning as you hear what's going on there. You could see versus the Ducks, the one thing that they're really going to miss is Hedman on the power play. Point as well, they really, at one point, they had Austin Watson playing the bumper because if you look, they don't have another right-handed shot. So uh they were trying all sorts of things. So the, the, that just kind of shows you there, there really aren't great replacements on the Lightning's roster. They are really top heavy. Like Mike said, I still think the Bruins are, you know, are a far better team, way better blue line. Um, so I, I kind of don't quite see this one. And like we always point out with the Bruins, this is the beauty of having two elite goaltenders. You get in these back to back spots and you don't have that huge drop off. So I like Boston. I think it's a, a good number. And yeah, great number if, if Point and Hedman remain out. Yeah. Also too, um, I was just doing some, uh, diving into Boston's back-to-backs here and and they've been solid on back-to-backs. It's funny when they've lost back to the second half, they've actually lost the first half as well. It's been like kind of oddly consistent in that way, but, uh, also too, a couple of these back-to-backs for Boston have, uh, gone into shootouts and overtime. So I wouldn't mind a little OT, uh, sprinkle here as well. If you're interested in that with just this two game slate, but I think you guys kind of hit the nail on the head, Tampa, super successful trip coming back home. Now, uh, Leboff kind of falls into your category of everybody's talking about them. Um, you know, look what they're doing again. I've seen some some articles like this Tampa roster is loaded, something like that, which is something we were not at all saying uh, early in the season. Are they playing better? Yes. But is their roster loaded? Um, I, I wouldn't say so in comparison to some of the um, other contenders uh, across the league. So uh, I think Boston's a good bet here. You're getting plus money here. It's uh you know, this isn't the toughest uh, travel trip in the world for the Bruins here either. So uh, these two teams play each other tremendously tight. So I, I lean Bruins and then a little toss on the uh, OT. Love it. Yeah, yeah I yeah. think those are good calls. And the, the the point to make about the Lightning isn't like they they know, they seemingly have, we, we give the Bruins a lot of credit for knowing how they have to win games and then executing on that game plan time and time again over the past three years. It does seem like the Lightning have kind of figured out their mix here. They're, it's not just this seven-game stretch that they've 
been playing well. They're the, the second half has been good. Twenty eight and two, um, twenty wins, eight regulation losses, and two overtime losses. I know that sounds like twenty eight wins, two losses, but um, so they've been playing at a at a good clip for a while now. Some some good wins. That the power play and the penalty killer are really good. Obviously, that power play leads the league close to thirty percent. Um, so they they know what they need to do. They need a kind of a specific game to break out for them to to pull it off more often than not but um just something to keep in mind i don't i don't i don't think that this is a team that has the the depth that as tim noted like the other uh elite contenders do so uh this is i think that as nick has concisely pointed out better team as a slight underdog i would play boston to uh minus 115 once again just barring anything weird uh from the tuesday night game against the panthers also uh, boston a uh, a top 10 kill so that's yeah. uh, huge need that you if know, you're playing tampa bay <laughs> yeah and that like it might help hold up the number a little bit that the, and i know it was a bit of a letdown spot for the ducks or for the lightning anyways playing a back-to-back in in uh, anaheim at the end of the road trip but they were pretty awful in that game i was really pissed to lose my my ducks bet because i thought the ducks were full value probably the better team uh, the ridiculous knob saved by Johansson and and the drop pass to nobody in overtime really did us in. Those will happen when you're betting on the Anaheim Ducks, but I don't think that like proved the case that without Point and Headman, this team's going to be able to go very far at all. Losing a game in which Ro- Ross Johnston scores the the goal of the year. Shame on the Ducks. Uh, okay, other game. The stakes are not nearly as high. The schedule makers definitely thought that they. They figured this one out at the beginning of the year when they when they did the schedule. They're like, oh man, Sabres and Senators, both teams probably fighting for a playoff spot. This is going to be a huge, huge game on Wednesday, March the 27th. Um, weirdly, it hasn't turned out that way because these teams never let you down in that respect. Um, but here we are, Sabres and Senators in Buffalo, 7 p.m. Eastern puck drop. So right before the, the Bruins and Lightning game and uh buffalo is sitting minus 138 senators plus 115 total of six and a half nick i think a lot of people look at this game and say whatever team was the underdog i'm gonna bet is it that simple uh do you want to go a little deeper than that i feel like that's honestly a reasonably fair take on it i feel like we could almost you know do the clown face paint with trying to go back to the senators here but this is what the Sens do. They they love winning these stupid pointless games as underdogs they did it twice on the weekend and they, I mean, they are healthier now. They've played pretty reasonable. It's the classic sense um, where, you know, if you're going to get the goaltending, I feel really confident they can skate with Buffalo uh, right now. And and the Sabres had a solid road trip. Uh, we were big on them on Sunday in Calgary when I thought they were mispriced. But I think they're actually getting a lot of credit here versus a Sens team that I actually think is playing way better hockey than the Flames right now. Um, you know, you do need to bank on the Sens getting goaltending. But I continue to believe the talent on the roster deserves to be a, like, priced a little more evenly with the Sabres here. The Sabres might get Jack Quinn back, which is a notable add. But with that said, they it looks like they're going to bump Greenway to the top line after J.J. Paterka had a great road trip playing there. So I think that does hurt them. They've kind of tried to go with this Greenway look a lot this year on the top unit with uh, Thompson and Tuck, and it really hasn't been a good fit. I don't really see what the hopes with going back to that is. So, yeah, I, I think we have to do it with Ottawa. Yeah, I mean, I was just, we were talking before we hit record here, we were kind of charting how the odds makers have, have priced Ottawa. And it's just been, you know, much like I think a lot of people felt um, and the schedule makers felt this game was going to be like uh, going into the season. I think they, they got... Uh, they got a lot of love for a while and for all the reasons, Nick, that you have mentioned on this program ad nauseum for, um, you know, they deserved better uh, from what they got in net. They Their roster construction, like, shouldn't be this bad. Uh, we just expected more from them. And if you just chart the way uh, their odds, they've been, uh, the, the odds makers have priced them to a day, day, day-to-day basis. It's like, they're a huge favorite and then they're a dog and this it's like they're the most Jekyll and Hyde type team and it makes them impossible to price and handicap. So I think it kind of fits a, a good spot here to back Ottawa because now we're getting a team that is definitely, definitely in their class, definitely a team that they can beat. And, um, you know, we're getting a plus money price here. This is, 
I, I know we've been talk giving Buffalo a lot of love, especially with the you know the unders that were good to us. But this is a this is a pretty like ringing endorsement um, of Buffalo here to be like clearly being stated as the better team, which you know. Uh, I can't argue for someone um, saying a team's better than the senators, which the way with the way they've let me down this year, but I just think we're getting some value here on Ottawa. Yeah. The other look too that could be a, a less uh, nauseating way to play this game for people who've just had enough of the senators. If uh, UPL is in goal and his save props 27 and a half, uh, I think you would just, I would play that. I'd probably lean towards that almost being my preferred play. It's hard to say where it would be. Like I have some hopes it would be that low, just given the way that Buffalo has defended a lot more recently, but the senators are still trending well past 30 shots on goal per game, which is pretty consistent with the team. They just, you know, they always, but they always hang in. We saw the way they were versus Boston. They'll, they'll hang in with these good teams and get their looks. It just probably won't mean anything because Corpus is at the other end. So that could be a, another way to target this one. It's, beautiful I'm, I'm just thinking about when they got uh shot out from a single shot on net against nashville in that third period it's like oh, that's the best but the preds are wagon so whatever we'll just give them that they can play toe to toe with boston five on five and then not record a shot on net for a full like 35 minutes that's they're that's just what... like the devils it's all the same shit they're like yeah they can play with the top teams and they can make you believe that maybe they can be one of them at some point but then they just don't know how to win bad goaltending like feels like they don't have kind of that juju in the big moments of the game and it's getting to the point where it's like you almost have to like kind of credit that because it's just over and over nobody uh, until the season's over and then they've got the juju in the big moments and then everyone starts proclaiming them to be a winner next year we're getting that stage now i think oh it's so tough they could have told so many great stories going into this game right Wow. Identical teams with their rebuilds and their frisky and look out lightning Leafs, Bruins. This is the next, this is the next generation of Atlantic teams. And, uh, Wait till no. next year. We'll do it again next year. We'll do it you know, July 5th or so. Um, right before everyone goes to their cabins, right. The last thing that they do is they say, this is the year for the senators and Sabres. Um, more exciting than that game. And, perhaps more exciting than both games on the slate is we have uh, a legitimate 50 to one long shot to talk about in the Jack Adams award race. Uh, let's just set it up. Rick Tockett is, is the odds on and he's a prohibitive favorite minus four seventy right now. Uh, Spencer Carberry, the Washington capitals has surged up the board. We talked about him uh, what about five, six weeks ago that if you were going to, if you were a believer that the Capitals can make a playoff push, just to bet him at triple digits. Hopefully uh, you did that. Paul Maurice is the third favorite at 12 to one. Then it's Peter Laviolette, 21 to one. Rick Bonus 27 to one. John Tortorella at 41. And then we get to Andrew Burnett, who is 50 to one to win the Jack Adams award, which seems awfully, awfully long for a guy who's taken a Predators team that nobody thought was going to be near the playoff race going into the year uh, and that nobody thought was going to be in the playoff race a month into the season uh, because they started so poorly. And now here they are, not only in and comfortably snug in a playoff spot, uh, 88 points from 78 games, not only do they have a 15-0-2 record in their last 17 games, but they're on pace for uh, over 100 points. And like this is a this is quite the story, and the Predators are getting a lot of love, I think, because of the streak, but it seems like the conversation stops like right before people want to say, why aren't more people talking about Andrew Burnett uh, for the Jack Adams? And I wonder if it's just that everyone had their minds made up about Rick Tockett months ago, and they thought this race was over, um, but it's not. Or at least, you know, who knows? This is this vote award is voted on by the broadcasters. Um so we we don't really even like it's it's not like journalists where you can like read and kind of get through some tea leaves to see where the vote is heading um as you can with other awards but like the, the, it makes no sense to me that brunette isn't the second favorite right now which sounds crazy cuz he's 50 to 1 because when you think about the other teams right like carberry he's 10 to 1 he definitely deserves to be up there but um his team still has to make the playoffs for him to to uh make good on those odds then you have paul maurice like the 
Panthers were a Stanley Cup finalists last year, and they've been great this year. Maurice deserves a ton of credit, but he's not, it's not like he's taken a roster of, of nobodies and turned them into a contender. Um, so, yeah, great job by Paul Maurice. Don't think he should be priced this far ahead of Andrew Burnett. Then there's Peter Laviolette. Great season from the Rangers. First year there. Um, could win the President's Trophy. That definitely would bode well for him. Um, he's 21 to 1. Don't think he should be that far ahead of uh, Brunette. I think Bonus at 27 to 1. And Tor- I mean, even Tortorella at 40 to 1, I don't think is a bad bet either. Uh, but it makes no sense to me, Nick, that Brunette isn't somewhere between or somewhere in that pocket Harbury and Maurice range. Like, I would switch him with Paul Maurice at making pocket 12 to 1 and Maurice 50 to 1. Yeah, I 100% agree with you here on Brunette, Mike. I think that 50 to 1 is way too long. I get why Talkit is such a favorite. Uh, the Canucks obviously have overachieved a lot and they're right at the top of the standings. But I think if Vancouver doesn't finish as like a President's Trophy winner and the Preds and the Canucks finish pretty evenly, I can't see how this is 50 to 1 at all. I think it's realistic to say that the Preds could pull within about eight points of the Canucks. And at that point, I could not see much reason why anyone should be voting Talkit over Brunette. If you look at some of the preseason takes, ourselves included, we didn't think the Preds were going anywhere. We thought the Canucks had a pretty good chance. I think we actually gave out uh, a lot of Canucks stuff on our first preview of the year. Didn't give out any Preds stuff because it was even harder to see this team being good. Their preseason point totals were still a lot lower. So I think what Brunette has done really deserves to be credited. I would be crediting my guy Carberry the same way if he was 50 to 1, but I think that this number is just way too long. If the Preds finish like even kind of close to how they have been, I think that he has to get the credit. So I think all it takes is a bit of a slow finish from the Canucks and a hot finish from the Preds. And at 50 to 1, that's a pretty decent combination to aim for. Yeah. And whatever happened to, uh, you know, we're getting the Nathan McKinnon. Hart Trophy, and a lot of people feel like it's uh, part of it is that he's owed one, not just he, his play, but he he's owed one a bit. Well, why isn't Brunette owed some uh, some accolades here? I feel like this guy's gotten a raw deal uh, uh, just about his entire coaching career. You think back to Florida um, when Quinville stepped down, and then like that team, I think did they win the President's Trophy that year? It came close. They, did. Like, they, they, they scored yeah, the they, most goal, like historic goals, and yeah. And, and, and you then, know who got it, Nick, that year? Who was that? Was that Rod? It was, no, it was your guy, Daryl Sutter. Yeah, we were on Oh, Sutter. wait, that, that was, was huge for us. Yeah, that was yeah, our, that was the big, the one of the biggest scores of, of my life was that Daryl Sutter win. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that Brunette has like, it, it, it's like this weird, even like it, it, it almost mirrors him as a player. Like just he's having like a, he had a very good solid NHL career as a player was considered like a good middle six, like locker room guy and didn't get much. Not many people were talking about him as a player. I feel like they're just like, yeah, that, that's who he is as a coach, but he is, he's been sensational for, um, for the predators. You talked about the season um, preseason expectations, Nashville's uh Point total was around like 85 and a half, 87 and a half uh, coming into the year. Uh, they've already gone over it. I know Vancouver has as well, but we could see a team that was, you know, an 85 point projection, 86 point projection, um, top, you know, 102 points. So I, I think that there's a huge case to be made here. They'll have to stay hot down the stretch. They don't need to continue this absurd 15 0 and 2, never lose in regulation pace. But they're, um, if they can get to that, you know, hundred point mark, which is seems very likely at this point, uh, the conversation should pick up. You need a couple other things to break your way. I think that you'd probably want a team like Colorado uh, to win the President's Trophy, a team that, uh, or Florida even, like, because I don't still don't think Maurice will get it, even if they do it. You don't want to see the Rangers or or Canucks do it, um, but. It's a 50 to one shot here. So like some things have to break your way. I think that the fair price would probably be around 10 or 12 to one. So you're getting some, some really, uh, really good value there on our man, Andrew Brunette. And I think if you wanted to sell me on the Tortorella argument, you could do that as well. Like it, it basically almost apply all that we're talking about with the predators bar the, the crazy hot streak and, and just put the flyers and in, instead of the predators and talk about Tortorella. Um, you could do that as well. 
Uh, so, and, and I want to say too, Leboff, what should be uh, part of the brunette campaign is, you know, he was an assistant with New Jersey last year, right? Hundred percent. Yeah. And, and look, look where New Jersey's done. Um, and especially the, the offensive, like progressive mind that Burnett seems to be like, that was the devil's MO last year. And look at them now. It's, it's just, he, I feel like it, for some reason it gets overlooked. Maybe it's because of their Nashville. Maybe it's because I think a lot of hockey people put, um, a lot of stock into Barry Trotz being in the front office there, like in, and think that maybe it's uh, like Trotz has a lot of influence and, in, you know, the sphere thing and all that. I feel like he's just not getting, Burnett's just not getting his full cookies and he hasn't in, in like the last three years. It's this guy's owed one. Come on. Yeah. And the, the Preds have a reasonable schedule down the stretch here, which is a, a great note because they have some wins that should be, very manageable so i think it's like realistic that they don't you know fall off too bad here they get arizona this week they have a couple of notably soft, soft matchups left um home versus boston which i think they can win like they can win versus anyone the way they're playing and yeah like tim said more and more you look at just the sample of what brunette's done i didn't really rate what he did that much with florida that year because they started eight no under quenville and the way the playoffs went but now you look at the way that he, like you said, performed with the Devils, the way he's performing this year, it seems more and more that he is just causation to some of this offensive dominance. So I like that. I got to, you know, the, Carberry deserves to be where he is too, but that's the thing. Carberry's appropriately priced, I think, as much as I, I love the guy and that's the best case scenario for me personally. In my head, when no sites had odds up for this like five days ago, I thought Carberry and... and uh, Brunette were in with roughly the same shot. So yeah, I thought the reason that a lot of the books were taking them down was because they didn't want to let people keep betting those two guys. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, that's why we love the Jack Adams Award race, man. We talk about it ad nauseum in the in the offseason and in the preseason, and it's just the one that ends up flying under the radar. And you're looking at a at a legitimate candidate with a fifty to one price because it's such a niche market. Um, so. Yep, that that price is a fan duel fifty to one on Brunette. The Predators, uh, just one closing note, they are on eighty eight points from seventy one games. That puts them five back of the Jets. The Jets play the Oilers on Tuesday night. The, the Predators play the Knights. We could see that the, there could be a universe that we wake up on Wednesday morning and the Predators have a good chance to catch the Jets as well. So there are uh, certainly avenues here. Real quick, um, let's just briefly touch on the Hart Trophy. Race. It does seem like it's Nathan McKinnon's award to lose. Um, Tim, you you wanted to talk about this because I think you, your man Nikita, you you are trying to make a case for Nikita Kucherov, or you're trying to figure out why this these these odds are as lopsided as they look. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I've had uh, I've had this take for a couple months now that I actually do believe because Kucherov didn't try in the All Star game and the skills competition that that effect is going to affect uh, his voting in. A part of it is like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And then I, I kind of like hope that him and Nate are so neck and neck. And I can be like, I told you guys because he didn't try that, that cost him the trophy. But I, I'm just, I'm just looking at, um, I'm just kind of surprised to see McKinnon's not, or Kucherov just being, you know, really the dog to McKinnon here. I, I think McKinnon's fantastic. But if you just think about what this lightning team started as with no Vasilevsky, they're banged up. They, you know, we're, weren't getting much from Stamkos. You know, Sergachev goes down. I, I just feel like he's been, because he doesn't play as loud of a game as Nathan McKinnon, I think a lot of casuals just overlook what he does. I mean, he's he's dragging this team, um, you know, to the finish line a lot of nights. And now, like, I feel like the numbers should be getting closer between the two because of Tampa Bay's recent run. And it feels like it's getting wider between the two. Yeah, I, I, I'm i a little less like in agreement just because I think what McKinnon does in the middle to me, like if I'm coaching a team tomorrow, I love Kucherov. I think he's been amazing. But if you have to win a game tomorrow based off this year's play, are you picking Kucherov? I I don't know. Like I think McKinnon's had a higher and like greater influence on the game. I get that he plays the majority of his minutes with Taves and McCarr. So maybe you got to factor that in, but I don't think Kucherov's role has been as horrific as people think this year too. Now that points gotten it going, like you look at the other night versus Anaheim when points sat out, what did Kuch do? And I, it's not really fair to rate a one game sample, but I do think it's also like 
I don't know, you, you take away his center, who's been pretty dominant recently, didn't look quite the same. So I'm not really trying to play or hate on uh, Kucherov. I just, to me, I can see this. I, I do think that McKinnon's been the better play, player this season. And, and there is probably some, it feels like, I mean, this is voted on by the writers, and it feels like a lot of writers have been, you know, outspoken about that Nate is owed one. It felt like that, like going into the year. Um, so that could be a, what's baked into it. I, I, for the record, I would take, you know, McKinnon over Kucherov. I just, I, he's, McKinnon's probably my favorite player to watch in the league. I just feel like Kucherov is this lightning team. I feel like there's just this media sentiment to all of a sudden be like, Oh, like the lightning are back to being like old lightning, of course. And it's like, dude, this guy was quite the constant for them. And I think he actually does more with less. I think I, cause I would take it. Um, at the Avalanche's top dogs over Tampa's, I think. Oh, for sure. I, I mean, I'm not going to dispute that. And I do think part of it, like you said, like it, it's it's close, but I think McKinnon's been the better player. And then I think the the votership, like you said, is a clear factor because I do think there are way more, you know, members of the media here in North America that are like, all right, let's give it to Nate. I don't know if I want to give it to Kucherov, but especially when, you know, you can probably say that it's fair to give it to Nate anyways. So I think that's what makes it a little tough. All right. Uh, that does it. So hopefully um, we can reconvene sometime in the middle of June, celebrate some Andrew Brunette winnings. But uh, until then, you'll be stuck with us talking about Thursday's games. Uh, and then we'll be back again next week. Uh, a lot busier on Thursday. But until then, best of luck with your bets for Wednesday. For Nick and Tim, thank you for listening. Thank you to our producer, Noah. Uh, we will talk to you soon. 